Um, just one um, announcement. Uh, we have a save the date. Um, we're really excited that we have um, Angela Saini, um, who has written this book, Superior, um, which is a very sort of timely and important book on the legacy of race science. Um, that's going to be on October 8th um, at 530. There will also be a, um, an opportunity for students to meet separately um, through a Zoom in a smaller setting um, after the main event as well. So there'll be more information um, coming from that um, in the coming weeks. So please um, put that on uh, your calendar. So I am uh, really excited um, and humbled and thankful that we have Dr. Owen Edwards with us, um, who has stayed up late. Um, but thankfully, he's on the west coast of Australia, not the east coast, so it's only midnight. Um, it could be two in the morning, I guess. Um, Owen and I met a number of years ago um, in Australia, part of the very beginnings of the, of the GBIRD program, actually before the GBIRD program existed. Um, and I've come to really um, admire his work and I'm really fascinated by what he's doing outside of the GBIRD program, which is what he's going to talk to about us today. Um, I also think he has probably the coolest title, like Domain Leader of Environment and Biocontrol. Um, at this Australian scientific organization, CSIRO, um, that I'll let Owen uh, maybe tell you um, a little bit more about. Um, so please um, help me welcome um, Dr. Edwards, um, and Owen, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Todd. And thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to tell you what we're um, working on and doing our best to try to save the, or help save the Great Barrier Reef as well as uh, reefs elsewhere around the world. Um, as Todd said, uh, I work for CSIRO, which is the uh, national research organization um, in Australia. It doesn't really have an equivalent in the US as it covers pretty much all of the sciences. So it would be NASA, USDA, NSF, I don't know, NIH, pull, put them all together into a single organization. Um, uh, I, I, at the moment, I, I, as Todd said, I'm a domain leader in something that's called the CSIRO Synthetic Biology Future Science Platform, which is basically a, 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 uh, a platform that was put in place that would help Australia catch up with the US and, and, and Europe in terms of um, establishing and building synthetic biology capability. It started uh, about four years ago. Um, and I basically oversee projects, including funding of projects in the area of environment and biocontrol. So these are environment focused projects, obviously. And we do work in generally in four areas. Um, uh, first one being bioremediation. A uh, uh, second one being associated with the work that I do in, in genetic pest control. Um, so that's the work that we do and link in with uh, colleagues in North Carolina State there uh, around the G-Bird program. Um, Third area is actually engineering resilience, and so trying to to make ecosystems more resilient to um, uh, to climate change and other environmental change. Um, and we actually have actually also have a program that's focused on symbionts, which is interesting, uh, and using uh, symbionts as as manipulators of of um, organisms and ecosystems, and 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 that ties in a bit to this as well as you will see. Uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. There'll be photos of them as, as this goes along. Uh, uh, this work is primarily done by, by a postdoc, Patrick Berter, uh, who works with us and with uh, Madeline Van Oppen, who's our main collaborator at University of Melbourne and the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And she's the, the true coral biologist, ecologist, and, um, and geneticist. Uh, our contribution to the project is actually that we're, we're, um, we have expertise in invertebrate stress. And so um, we're taking that and helping them to understand how, how corals are responding to stress, and in particular, in this case, to, to, um, to, uh, to heat. Um, also have some collaborators at Macquarie University in Sydney, and I sh should say that some of this work was funded by the Paul Allen Foundation. And of course, this first slide shows uh, an absolutely pristine um, coral reef, uh, very healthy. Hey, very, Owen, very, can you just, yeah. Owen, just, you need to share your screen with us. Oh, is it not? Oh, no, good. not yet. <laughs> well, try that again then. 
Perfect. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, as promised. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is a, a a pristine coral reef, extremely difficult to find around the world uh, these days. It's much more common, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, this is more often what we're seeing these days. Um, this is obviously an image of a, a bleached um, coral reef, and there's absolutely no question that climate change is the biggest threat that's ever existed uh, to coral reefs on the planet. Uh, and this can happen very fast. This is actually uh, from French Polynesia uh, with a heating event that occurred in, uh, in the late, late or the early summer of uh, down here of uh, December 2014. Um, that's actually a healthy reef there. Uh, by February of 2015, so a couple of months later, the reef was completely bleached. And by August the following year, so after a period of eight months, uh, the reef was completely dead. Um, and so that's how quickly it is. And when a reef has been impacted in this way, it can take uh, usually it's, you know, more than 10 years for the reef to recover. And it's really important that there aren't any subsequent uh, bleaching events that occur uh, during that recovery process or it basically has to start again. And that's what's been happening with the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Of course, this, these images, this is from the Northeast coast uh, the Queensland coast of Australia. This is where the Great Barrier Reef is. Um, and we had two major bleaching events in consecutive years in 2016 and 2017. The red dots are showing where there was the most severe bleaching and green where there was neg negligible bleaching. The 2016 event was, was particularly bad. The only thing that saved the southern part of the reef in that year was the co- that a, a cyclone came at exactly the same time. And basically the cloud cover from a cyclone um, saved the bottom half of the reef that year. Uh, the 2017 event wasn't quite as bad, but was particularly bad just because it followed only one year after the 2016 event. And the combination of these two events led to uh, an a, a, a estimate of 50% mortality or 50% reduction in coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef across these two years. Um, and unfortunately, the bad news, even worse news, is that there was another bleaching event this year. Um, and so that's basically uh, three bleaching events in five years. And every indication is that they're going to become more and more frequent. Uh, we're very interested in interventions that increase coral thermal tolerance, but obviously that's not the only story. Um, we have to try to mitigate the effects. Uh, we have to reduce uh, the, 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 the um, release of, of carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, at the moment, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in the water temperature is irreversible. Probably two and a half degrees is already irreversible. Um, and uh, basically we're, we're moving up from there. And so it's just gonna to continue to increase un, un, unless we claim some control o, over the um, carbon emissions. Uh, we also have issues in Australia that the Great Barrier Reef is right next to an agricultural um, region. So we have uh, a catchment runoff that includes pesticides, but also includes um, nitrogen from fertilizers. That nitrogen in particular, um, leads to the outbreak of pests such as the crown of thorn starfish, which is a native pest, but has outbreaks uh, in response uh, quite often to, to the increase in nitrogen within the water. And this can absolutely destroy reefs within a period of a few days, uh, an outbreak of, of the crown of thorn starfish. Um, there are conventional management methods that are available. Um, and there are repair methods that, that are available, but very few of these can be done at scale. We're now starting to, to try and do the quite radical uh, steps, uh, such as um, uh, you know, trying to put up shades and engineer or, or uh, interfere with cloud cover, et cetera, in order to protect. Um, but my group, and we're particularly interested in, in um, genetic solutions. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we're trying to establish ways in which we can uh, accelerate what might happen anyway, 
Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't happen, doesn't seem to be happening fast enough in terms of uh, adaptation of corals to the, to the high temperatures. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I should explain that corals exist as a symbiosis between corals, uh, the coral host and microalgae, uh, dinoflagellate uh, algae that um, basically live within coral cells. Um, they get carbon dioxide and coral host, and in return, um, they, they uh, use the carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and they return the photosynthetic products. And basically, the majority of the nutrition for the coral comes from these nutritional symbionts. It's an unusual symbiosis in that it has to be reestablished every generation. It is obligate, but the symbionts do have a free living form. And so, um, I don't know, can, can you see the arrow? If I'm pointing onto the screen, yeah. Um, so from your coral host, uh, it spawns usually just once a year, producing eggs and sperm. You get fertilization, and that when the larvae hatches, that's when the symbiodinium, which is the, uh, the microalgal um, symbiont, is acquired. Uh, the larvae then settles, develops, and forms into an adult coral. Uh, the bleaching occurs when the, uh, when the symbiodinium symbionts are actually expelled by the coral. Uh, and that bleaching, um, obviously, the, 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 uh, the coral loses its color as part of that process, um, but it also loses its main source of nutrition. And so generally, the, the corals will then starve to death. So Madeleine Van Oppen has been proposing for, for a few years the idea of assisting evolution and eventually the, the, the thoughts of bioengineering of corals, uh, not only of the symbiont, but also of the animal. And so there have been proposals and papers through the past 10 years that have, uh, that have suggested assisted gene flow, uh, selective breeding, hybridization methods, conditioning, and most recently, genetic engineering as approaches that could be applied to the coral host. Um, the, the part of the problem with focusing on the coral host is this issue that it only spawns usually once per year. And so it's very hard to do genetic work on something that it only undergoes uh, sexual reproduction once a year. And at the moment, it's entirely under environmental control. We don't have the means by which we can control that under a, in a laboratory setting. Um, in natural environments, it's actually quite slow to disperse. Corals are actually quite slow to disperse, which is much more around the physics of a coral reef than the capacity of the, of the larvae to, re, to, to disperse. And corals are actually really difficult to produce at scale. Uh, and so the repair work that's done with cultured corals is an extremely slow process. I get asked all the time, can't we just let nature take its course? And um, I'm showing here some work from a paper the, from Madeleine Van Oppen's group uh, last year. And this is actually uh, showed, and this is one reef around Heron Island here, uh, which modeled and showed that the natural spread of a, an adaptive allele that occurred naturally, uh, and such as heat tolerance, within 100 generations would only make it to the next neighboring reef. Uh, clearly, that's not fast enough uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with the rate of change that we're seeing. Um, with human assistance, so such as assisted gene flow, we can get hundreds of migrants moved per generation realistically. And to doing that, we could fix adaptive alleles in dozens of neighboring reefs within 30 generations. Um, with thousands of reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, again, um, this approach just doesn't appear to be sufficiently scalable. So we focused our attention at the bottom here on uh, modifications that potentially could be done with, uh, with mi the microbes, so the, the entire microbiome of the coral, but in particular with these um, nutritional symbionts, the microalgae. Uh, people have looked for naturally tolerant strains and, and they do occur, um, but which mu we're much more interested in uh, taking a broader approach that could be applied to a wider range of symbiont species and so um, we do what we're, is referred to in, in the coral literature as experimental evolution. For those of us in agriculture, it's just artificial selection. Uh, and eventually, we're plan the plan is to be able, once we understand the mechanisms, 
uh, explore the potential of engineering those mechanisms into additional species. So the advantage of the symbiont is there are multiple generations per year, uh, usually about 30 generations per year. So it, we, can, uh, we believe we can evolve them much faster. They can be maintained in culture because they do have a free living form outside of the host. There are generalist species, uh, including the ones that we work on specifically, um, that can form symbiosis with host species. And so um, we can potentially impact many species with a single uh, selection event. Um, good news is that under certain circumstances, they can reform symbiosis with bleached corals, with bleached adult corals. Uh, and so there's a possibility of using this as a recovery strategy and not just a, uh, a breeding strategy for the future. And there is considerable evidence that shows that the symbionts actually do contribute to heat tolerance uh, when they're in symbiosis with the corals. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the assisted evolution, the directed evolution uh, process that, that we've gone through. This has actually started before um, uh, I became involved with the program because it actually started about seven years ago. And um, uh, Patrick Berger is the main postdoc on the project, Madeline Van Oppen I described, and John Oakshot is, is our, our uh, stress response um, expert at CSIRO. And so basically we removed the algal symbionts from a coral host, put them into culture, and then uh, over a period of four years, uh, wild type strains were maintained at 27 degrees Celsius and then 10 selected strains were put at 31 degrees Celsius for four years. So that's about 120 generations. Um, these do reproduce primarily uh, asexually. Um, there is a, there, it is possible for them to reproduce asexually, but we haven't actually figured out how to induce sexual reproduction yet. So this was primarily through uh, asexual reproduction over about 120 generations. We then, um, after that period of selection, did in vitro experiments where uh, we exposed the, the wild type and the selected strains to three weeks at elevated temperatures, so at um, 31 degrees and at 27 degrees, and compared how the two responded. And uh, not surprisingly, I suppose, uh, after that level of selection, the selected strains actually grew better at the elevated temperatures than the wild type. On the top, Two graphs here, we see two different selected strains. The selected strains have an SS in front of them. Um, the, the dark red uh, shows how they performed at normal temperatures at 27 degrees. And the pink uh, shows that they actually continue to have positive growth uh, at 31 degrees, which contrasts with the wild type shown at the bottom, which did grow well at 27 degrees, but basically uh, crashed at 31 degrees, which is generally what we will see um, uh, uh, um, from, from the wild type individuals, both in culture and in the field. Um, a, a couple of things that were measured. So the first one is again, is just cell growth. And on these graphs, um, you'll see at the bottom, uh, we have the 10 selected strains, and then on the far right, the two wild type strains. So looking at cell growth, and this is just the number of cells per mil in culture, you see that all of the selected strains had positive cell growth to different degrees, whereas the two wild type strains had negative cell growth. Um, again, this is in vitro, this is in culture at 31 degrees Celsius. In terms of uh, photosynthetic output, um, the, the, this is the difference uh, well, I, I don't have time to get into the, the details of it, but basically the level of photosynthetic efficiency remained high in the selected strains uh, and dropped off considerably in the, uh, in the wild type strains. And we also looked at the production of reactive oxygen species, which were actually produced in response to stress, as well as a number of them were produced as, as part of photosynthesis. Um, but it has been proposed that the reactive oxygen species and the release of those by the symbiont may be the trigger that, uh, it, uh, that causes the, the coral host to expel, um, uh, leading to the bleaching. And so um, we were encouraged to see that, uh, that there was basically no release of reactive oxygen species uh, 
Um, so there was, doesn't seem to be any indication of heat stress amongst the selected strains, whereas in the wild type, we did see a quite substantial release of reactive oxygen species. Uh, so, so clearly, the, the selection process was having an effect, a positive effect. We then uh, returned the symbionts to the coral host and asked the question as to whether those uh, heat tolerant symbionts would confer heat tolerance also to the host, um, the host alga, or the host uh, coral, sorry. And this was done and, and then measured the entire holobiont, which is the, the uh, coral and the symbiont together, to elevated temperatures. And again, we looked at, uh, at, at fitness characteristics. And we found something quite different. Um, again, on these graphs, we have this, the 10 selected strains on the x-axis and the two uh, wild type strains on the right. And again, in terms of cell growth, what we saw, and this is in hospite, so this is within the coral larva, we saw only three of the uh, selected strains actually increased in, in number within the in coral larva. And we saw no bleaching uh, occurring in, in, uh, in coral that had these three symbiont strains. The other seven selected symbiont strains um, basically uh, eventually disappeared. So they reduced in number uh, within the coral host. And we did see bleaching occurring, symptoms of bleaching in these, uh, which was also um, what we saw in the wild type. Interesting that the photosynthesis was actually maintained at about normal levels uh, in pretty much all of the selected strains and the wild type. Um, when the when these uh, um, uh, when the symbionts were returned to the to the larval host, but I did want to remind you that what I showed you previously from from uh, the the production of reactive oxygen species, and this was done in culture, um, that we didn't see any uh, increase in reactive oxygen species from any of the selected strains, and yet only three of those. Uh, uh, did we see the, the, the lack of bleaching when it was returned to the coral host? So clearly the production of these reactive oxygen species isn't the only factor that's triggering the bleaching response. There's clearly something else um, that's involved. Um, as I said, uh, I mean, it was very nice that we, we were able to produce uh, not only symbionts, but also coral, the whole of ions, the coral with the symbionts. Uh, that had increased heat tolerance. Um, but we were very interested in understanding the mechanisms. And so what we did next is we did transcriptomics on the holobiont. So on both the chiral RNA and the algal symbiont RNA, and then analyzed those uh, separately, separated them bioinformatically and, and analyzed the uh, transcriptional response. And we didn't do this with all the strains. We did it with uh, four different strains. We did with this SS8, which is one of the strains that conferred the heat tolerance to the coral host, with SS3 and 5, which were two strains that were heat tolerant in culture but did not confer that heat tolerance to the coral host, and then one of the wild type strains. And I'm not going to go into the results in detail. I will say in general that the transcriptomic response, that much of the variation had to do with stress response genes, which is not surprising. We did see quite considerable differences amongst the strains in terms of how, how the, uh, the transcriptional differences that occurred compared to the wild type. But if we then kind of map the overall transcriptional response into a two-dimensional space, uh, generally we, we see a significant effect, a significant uh, divergence from wild type uh, and, and a general uh, um, common direction in terms of, of, uh, of the transcriptional uh, differences. Um, obviously, we have some candidates in here, but I'm not going to go into details of, of um, annotated candidates. Interestingly, we also see, saw a variation in the transcriptional response of the coral host. The coral host, of course, had not been selected, so these transcriptional responses appear to be uh, dependent entirely on the symbiont strain that was returned to those coral hosts. Uh, and again, we see variation uh, between the, the selected strains and between those and the wild type. And again, we see, see a similar pattern where we see a, 
a directional movement in terms of the transcriptional response, showing some common commonalities across uh, the three selected strains away from the wild type host. What we were particularly interested in though, was what transcriptional responses we saw that were different in the SS8, which is the one that conferred heat tolerance to the coral host compared to the SS3 and the SS5, which were heat tolerant in culture, but did not confer that heat tolerance to the coral host. And there were a number of genes, but in particular, of particular interest to us were a set of about 20 genes that were uniquely uh, upregulated in the SS8. And all four of them were associated with Rubisco pathway, and uh, so uh, which is part of photosynthesis, and in, pit, in particular around carbon fixation. We don't have a hypothesis why uh, the changes in carbon fixation might have been necessary um, um, in order to achieve uh, basically for the coral host to become thermal tolerant but it may have something to do with the fact that a greater efficiency of photosynthesis will also reduce, uh, lead to a reduction in the overall production of reactive oxygen species. But that's just a hypothesis at this stage. So what we found then that by looking at the transcriptomics, again, on this graph, we have the four, four um, strains that were examined by transcriptomics, the one that conferred SS8, uh, conferred tolerance to the host, SS5 and SS3 did not, and then the wild type. We saw stress response genes activated uh, in all of the selected strains, but the one that was different here in terms of uh, conferring it to the algal or to the coral host, we saw stress response genes activated and also carbon fixation genes activated. And so we're moving forward with, uh, with this particular hypothesis. Um, we immediately got asked because they were, these were asexual, uh, and um, uh, we immediately got asked by reviewers and, and colleagues as to whether there were any actual genetic changes that were occurring within these strains, um, or whether it was possible that all the changes were epigenetic and it was just conditioning that was occurring over these multiple generations. And so we decided that we would look at uh, mutations within the genomes of the, of the um, uh, the various algal strains uh, as across the 120 generations of selection. And so again, um, these, so on, on this particular figure, we've mapped all of the SNPs, all of the single nucleotide polymorphism mutations uh, that accumulated in the wild type here in blue, in the red and the green, which are the SS3 and the SS5, um, the ones that did not confer uh, heat tolerance to the coral host, and then the SS8 in the middle here. And you see this very unusual pattern, I think, in terms of um, not much variation uh, within the wild type and the SS3 and the SS5. Considerable uh, evolutionary trajectory, is, as I've described it in the title here, moving from the wild type to the selected strains. And then the SS8 sitting somewhere in between and maintaining a lot of, uh, of um, heterozygosity, actually, uh, is what we're seeing within that SSL8, whereas the other strains uh, showed a high level of fixation of, of these SNPs. And so if you map that out on a tree, you see a similar pattern with all the wild type at the bottom here, most of the SS3 and SS5 at the top and the SS8s in between, uh, or uh, map it out linearly, it seems that the SS08, again, is intermediate somehow between the wild type and the SS3 and the SS5. Um, when we actually uh, do an LD analysis and also FST analysis and actually map those mutations um, to particular regions of the genome, we actually see that the, the polymorphis polymorphisms are heavily clustered onto particular scaffolds or particular regions of the genome. Um, so there appear to be uh, uh, particular regions of the genome that are important. And of course, we're starting to identify candidate, uh, uh, candidate open reading frames within these scaffolds that might be contributing uh, at a genetic level to the, to the heat tolerance. I showed you before the transcriptomics in the coral host 
and showed that there was variation in the transcriptomics that we proposed or we hypothesized was coming from the effects of this of the um, uh, of the introduced uh, microalgal symbionts. And if we actually look at the accumulation of uh, of uh, SNPs in the coral hosts across the same period of time, we see that it basically is entire overlapping. There's clearly no differentiation, and we wouldn't expect any differentiation of the coral hosts uh, across the same uh, time period. Same if you uh, if you look at it as a as a tree. Um, what, what's particularly interesting is that we've taken the selected coral holobiont and we've um, started to grow them under ambient conditions. So this is cycling hot and cold temperatures. Uh, and what we see is that this SS8, uh, which is one of the most promising of the, of the, of the um, symbiont strains, which also confers it obviously coral host, is, was actually growing at about twice the rate um, of, the, of other selected or the wild type um, uh, corals. So uh, this could have something to do with the carbon fixation efficiency that we saw before, but we don't have any evidence of that as of yet. But it's very encouraging. And uh, we also, uh, Ruby Vanstone has been looking at the associated um, microbiome, the rest of the microbiome, the, particularly the bacterial communities that are associated with the corals. And, um, and basically all I wanna show here is that we have all of this cluster of red on the left and this bluish green on the right. Um, and this is before and after selection is indicated by, by triangles versus circles. Um, the selected is on the left, the wild type is on the right uh, with the difference in the colors. And what's particularly important here is these circles that have changed color because there seems to have been a shift uh, uh, after the selection of in, in one direction or the other, suggesting that, there, that these particular micro, uh, or um, um, microbial groups uh, may have some uh, relevance to, to, or may can be contributing in some way uh, to the heat tolerance changes that we're seeing. So what have we learned so far in terms of, of um, uh, the, the mechanisms involved? Well, we, as I said, we saw decreased uh, reactive oxygen species secretion in all the selected microalgae, but uh, that decreased ROS was not the sole determinant of the tolerance in symbiosis. Uh, because some strains conferred their tolerance to the holobiont and others did not. Uh, we did see, in all cases, upregulation of stress defenses in terms of the transcriptional response in the selected strains. Uh, but we also saw changes to rubisco carbon fixation um, in the one in the strain, and it's now multiple strains that that um, uh, confer heat tolerance to the host. Um, I describe it in this way. I describe it that each selected strain seems to have followed an independent evolutionary trajectory. We see different transcriptional responses, different um, mutations, SNPs being accumulated in different strains. Uh, we see a general pattern of the SSO8 being not as advanced in terms of its uh, uh, response in terms of, of heat stress um, uh, and uh, saw something similar with the accumulation of SNPs where it seemed to be intermediate. Uh, so the SSO3 and SO, SSO5 seems to have evolved further um, and has many more shared fixed differences whereas the SSO8 does not seem to have evolved as far in terms of heat tolerance, but has, uh, has retained some genetic variability within the strain, but has also then adapted in a different way in terms of the carbon fixation. Um, we have shown that the adult coral with the selected algal strains, at least with one of them, grows faster under ambient conditions, which is very encouraging. And there's a, some suggestion that other taxa in the microbiome may also be contributors in some way to the heat tolerance or maybe responding uh, to heat tolerance. What's next? Um, well, there's still a lot more to do, of course. Uh, we're continuing to characterize the thermal tolerance mechanism uh, at the moment. Um, my poor postdocs and students are spending about 20 hours a day running an experiment. 
uh, which is monitoring chlorophyll, reactive oxygen species, and also other candidate mechanisms for, uh, for thermal tolerance. Um, and it's a replicated time course experiment with all of the different selected strains and wild type strains um, over a period of about uh, 40 days. Um, so this is a very long experiment that's uh, in process at the moment. We're looking at the metabolome of the holobiont. Uh, uh, postdoc Katie Hillier is, is doing this as, uh, at the moment. We're very interested in fitness trade-offs in the altered coral holobiont. It's quite possible that uh, in some cases, stress response, improved stress responses can lead to improved uh, responses to other stresses, but it can also be a trade-off where increase in, in tolerance of one stress can lead to uh, a decrease in tolerance to other stresses. And so we're particularly interested in some of the other stresses that are occurring on the Great Barrier Reef, including uh, chemicals um, uh, and also pH. Um, we've applied uh, to do field evaluations of heat tolerant holobiont. Um, this we have to do with the regulator, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, um, and we have had some encouraging signs that they may approve some field trials for next summer. I mentioned at the beginning that, that some of these symbionts are generalists, and uh, the SS08, well, the species that we are working on, uh, um, it, uh, of the symbiont is actually a generalist one, and so we're very interested in introducing our selected strain, our most uh, uh, encouraging selected strain into other coral species to see if it, they also uh, uh, confer heat tolerance into other corals. Meanwhile, we're attempting to develop a genetic transformation methods for the, for the symbiont. Um, uh, the, these are actually really difficult organisms to work with. They have highly compressed uh, genomes, very, very large and duplicated and compressed genomes. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, a group to work with. Um, uh, but the, the basic hope is that we'll be able to, to take some of the mechanisms that we identify from the strain SS8 in particular, use that as a template for engineering or synthetic biology. So engineering uh, would be individual. The distinction I'm making is engineering of a, of a um, we have a sequestration, candidate sequestration mechanism for, for reactive oxygen species that we could put in, or synthetic biology if we have to basically put in an entire pathway. And in parallel, we're collaborating with, uh, with Lena Bay is, is um, at Australian Institute for Marine Science. Phil Clevis uh, has been at Stanford, um, is, uh, well, still at Stanford, but he's just recently been appointed uh, to the Carnegie Institution of Embryology in, in Baltimore. And he's developed uh, uh, CRISPR genome editing tools for corals and has been knocking out um, uh, genes associated with uh, including heat shock factors here uh, and showing that he can eliminate the, the bleaching response in corals by actually knocking out genes associated with the, uh, the or regulators of the heat response. Um, so we are still interested in parallel uh, investigations going on on the coral side. And finally, uh, I thought I'd throw in a couple of slides here to talk about public engagement, considering the forum in which I'm presenting uh, today. Um, uh, Aditi and, and Liz have been uh, doing surveys of the Australian public on a variety of synthetic biology applications. Uh, I don't they, they actually have a submitted paper that I don't, didn't want to, to, to reveal too much. Um, so I just have a couple of, of uh, results from survey here, which shows that the, there is a clear indication amongst the Australian population, they recognize that, the, that there's a problem with the coral reef, that it's a major uh, problem. That's not surprising. It gets a lot of attention um, in Australia. Uh, to what degree? Uh, would you support the use of these technologies? It's actually quite high um, for corals compared to some of the other applications, such as agricultural applications that we survey for. Um, we believe that this is a strong indication. There's actually a, a, a strong fear within Australia about the loss of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, 
So we've got combating fears amongst the public around the fear of new technologies or new approaches versus the actual fear of the ecological loss, the tourism dollars that are lost, the change of lifestyle, et cetera, that are associated with uh, the, um, the potential loss of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and I, I think this is an interesting one uh, to show because we asked the question, when would be the most appropriate time to introduce GM corals? For those other than the 10% that said not at all, uh, how much of the reef cover can we afford to lose before we consider this sort of approach? And generally the response was, we should be doing it while there's still 50% or more coral cover. And we've already passed that. And so um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, is, if we, as we continue with our public engagement, um, uh, we continue to get uh, some uh, support amongst the community and particularly the community that's uh, directly associated and relies on the Great Barrier Reef for, for uh, their livelihoods. So uh, that's it. That's everything I have to say for today. I'd be happy to, to entertain your questions or, or um, especially comments uh, and suggestions in terms of the directions of the research. And Great, thanks so much, Owen. Um, I already see some hands raised. So um, Eli, I'm gonna unmute you. So go ahead and ask your question. Hi, right, thank you so much. This, this talk is very close to my heart in lots of ways. I'm really glad uh, you stayed up for us. Um, my question, I guess, is, is kind of obvious in terms of application. The, the reef is diverse. It has lots of coral species and lots of symbiont species. Um, so as you look ahead, what do you imagine a potential application looking, by, looking like? Would you attempt to get into as many species as possible? Would you worry about disturbing the, the makeup of the community by introducing one at a sort of advantage? Yeah, um, I actually have a lot of faith in the system uh, in terms of, of manipulation. So I'm not, I'm not as interested in actually putting sim, uh, introducing symbionts into corals uh, in, in sort of farm situations or aquaculture situations and then releasing those corals. I'm much more interested in developing strategies where we actually release the symbionts um, in their free living form uh, at the time of spawning uh, and allowing those symbionts be acquired by, uh, by coral larvae in the field. Um, I'm really interested in pursuing ways in which we can develop uh, uh, that sort of method at scale. Obviously, not at the whole Great Barrier Reef scale, it's a bit ridiculous, but, uh, but at, at a scale that we could at, uh, at least consider doing it over, over a, a, a wider area than we might be able to, to, to just put out corals. Um, and, there, and we know there is competition. Um, you know, there's actually quite a wide diversity of these symbiont of the, um, of the dinoflagellate algae that are out there. And so that process of, of competition is actually occurring, or I'm calling it competition. I mean, it's uh, um, where, whereby the corals are, are, the coral larvae are probably acquiring different uh, symbionts with different characteristics, if not different symbiont species. And, uh, and those are adapting or, or responding to the local selection pressures. So I think it's a matter of introducing the heat tolerant symbionts into that ecosystem in the hope that they'll be acquired um, in, in a broader scale um, and, and, and can help to, to help with re reef recovery, I suppose. Um, we are exploring different ways of, of, uh, of potentially reintroducing these into adult corals as well, um, but that's more of a challenge uh, and requires much uh, additional technologies that we don't have yet. Am I crazy? What do you think? Uh-oh, you better be uh, muted. I'm not allowed to ask questions back. No, you can. <laughs> uh, Jen, go ahead and ask your question. Um, no, I don't think you're crazy. I, I, you know, initially, I think I actually like the idea of releasing it into the environment and kind of letting the fittest ones uh, make it. Um, because I guess my questions and concerns have to do with the fitness of these lab evolved strains. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So my background is in marine biology, but I do genetics now. So I really um, was very interested in this talk and I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, but my question is, so you have these um, selected strains of the symbiont that um, have evolved tolerance to temperature in the laboratory. Um, mm-hmm. And so I work with insects and they adapt very quickly to laboratory conditions. So is it possible that the most fit of these temperature tolerant strains in the lab will not be the most fit, you know, in the ocean? Yep. Very good question. How do you... Yes. So so thankfully, we actually have an intermediate uh, uh, means of evaluation between the laboratory and, and the field. Um, we have the Australian Institute of Marine Science has a has a um, a, a thing called a sea simulator, um, which is actually a a, a a a means by which I mean it's a huge laboratory, but that allows us to test corals under more natural um, conditions, um, and uh, and so we can. And we are evaluating the, the these the coral holobiont under those conditions first. And we have to do that in, in order to get the permission from the regulator to to put these corals anywhere near um, the Great Barrier Reef. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that doing the we propose to do the releases in in a Magnetic Island, which is a very isolated um, in, in inner reef uh, around a, an island that's just off the coast. Um, uh, to minimize the risk that there, that the that the uh, what we release could actually spread or 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 um, uh, have any long long standing uh, consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree with you completely, uh, and and I think uh, for most of us, um, we 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 it's hard for us to consider that we would have. Uh, it was hard for. for 20 years ago, it would have hard to believe that I would even consider doing this now. Yeah. Um, but uh, when we see what the actual ecosystem, how quickly the ecosystem is declining, we really are uh, considering quite radical interventions at this stage um, because uh, we can't just do nothing, um, yeah. to, to be completely honest. I mean, you know, th- they were talking about people are, are devising ways of of um, pumping water, uh, circulating water up and down within the Great Barrier Reef in order to basically reduce the surface temperatures. Mm-hmm. And so there are these engineering solutions that are absolutely mind boggling as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm much more concerned about those than I am. I have much more faith in evolution that, uh, that if we do put out something that is less fit, uh, it won't survive. Right. So along those lines, I have a, I have a follow up question. And because you're working, you know, with asexual propagation in the lab, and I'm thinking about um, the release of, you know, riddle mosquitoes, where genetic background has been a major issue. Um, you're limited to doing back crossing to specific um, population um, back, you know, genetic backgrounds. So, is there a sense of what the population genetic structure of the symbiont looks like? And is this going to be a problem or is it highly structured and you're going to have to introduce and or create these selected strains over and over for each population? Uh, very good question. Um, so, so we uh, basically at the moment, uh, well, I'll, I'll so the, these, these symbionts um, were all, about two years ago, we were within the same species that were just called um, uh, symbiodinium, uh, and they were all called different strains. At, now they're all called different species uh, based on uh, mostly on genome sequences that have been generated. But what I'm what I'm actually getting at is it's it's amazing to me how little is known uh, about the genetics and the population genetics of the symbionts and the coral hosts even. Um, uh, the, the start of genome sequencing, recent uh, genome sequencing of corals, which has uh, received funding because of the threats to the coral reefs, it's amazing how much they're finding uh, 
uh, the classification of coral species has been incorrect uh, in the past. And, uh, and a lot of the similarities in terms of morphology are due to environment. Uh, and so highly similar corals are actually different species and highly differentiated corals are actually the same species in different environments. And so, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of catch up that needs to be done. So uh, the species definition of the symbionts has been done. However, this, I haven't seen really strong information on the population genetics um, of the, or, I mean, basically the population structure of the, of the symbionts themselves. Uh, Dr. Sepanova, you should uh, be able to ask your question. Um, yes, I would like to ask it. Uh, my question is, uh, has to do with the fact that you are evolving the, the symbiont away from its host. So to me, it was not unexpected at all that seven out of 10 strains were no longer able to colonize um, the coral because when you're selecting algae in the absence of the host, you're basically um, selecting for the strains that are able to grow on their own, but not mm -hmm. reinforcing their ability to colonize. So is there a way of redesigning this um, directed evolution experiment with the way that you would every few generations, let's say every 10 generations, you come back to the host and, and still check for their ability to colonize and remain in, in symbiotic relationship with the host? Because if you evolve it separately, you are losing the genes that are required for colonization. Yeah. Um, so actually, well, I, I clearly, I, I'm. I, I, I didn't make it clear. Clear that we actually didn't lose those those symbiont strains. Didn't lose um, the capacity to recolonize those hosts. They actually did that successfully. Um, uh, what they did was that they they were then lost when those coral hosts were put at 31 degrees Celsius. So at 27 degrees, they were perfectly happy inside those coral hosts. It was only with the elevated temperature that they were actually expelled from the host. So you think this is the reaction of the host expelling them rather than inability of the algae to survive under high temperatures within the host? Uh, yeah, so, so that, that question has not been answered yet. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of debate as to w which which uh, organism is actually controlling the bleaching response. Um, I, uh, from from my perspective, having worked with quite a number of symbionts, uh, the the actual the the nature of the of the bleaching response, the expelling of the symbiont, is is basically a it's an apoptotic um, response, and so basically program cell death, which then releases the symbiont. And that in general uh, is an indication of uh, uh, that the symbiont is no, is no longer successfully disguising itself. Uh, the same sort of response we see with pathogens that are unable to disguise themselves uh, in a non-host. And, and you end up getting a defense response that involves program cell death, apoptosis, uh, and basically uh, as a means of defense. Um, so in general, the, that's why we think that the reactive oxygen species is an, it was at least an, an interesting hypothesis um, in terms of, uh, of, of the, um, uh, the signal that initiated the, the uh, bleaching response, because we know that when there's excess reactive oxygen species, these the, the, the uh, algae have to expel that into the environment, so that would be released into the cell. And reactive oxygen species are a major trigger of apoptosis. And so in that case, it would have made sense, but clearly there's something else involved from the data that I've shown today. It's interesting that you're saying that algae have a way of hiding or disguising them, themselves, as opposed to algae being actually recruited by the host because it benefits the host to have algae as a symbiont. Yeah, and so basically anything that lives inside the cell of some the cells of another organism, in general, have have to disguise themselves, uh, uh, in order that they don't trigger uh, the the cellular defense responses. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that in I mean that's very common amongst uh, amongst um, interest in ter, in tercellular symbionts. Sorry, getting late here. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, Joanna, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you may have touched on this, but are you testing these different um, heat tolerant species with different pH levels to account for its future ocean acidification? Um, yeah, so so we are looking at, at the response to pH as one of the trade-offs at the moment. Um, at it, about before the, the last five years, there was some debate as to which was more important, the pH or the temperature in terms of the major cause of bleaching, uh, because most both of them were, were basically becoming elevated in the oceans at the, at, uh, at the same time. Um, and so both could have explained it, but, but because of the bleaching events that have occurred over the last uh, approximately five years around the world, uh, most of the, most of the uh, coral biologists now say that clearly that the heat, heat is a much more important factor. Um, and, and so the focus is much more on heat tolerance ahead of pH tolerance at the moment. But, but as I said, I, I think it is an important, uh, it's obviously another stressor that is going to be continuing to increase in importance. And so we are having to look at it in terms of the, the potential trade-offs, yes. All right, Ellen, we'll just two more questions and then we'll let you go to bed. Um, Yasmin um, is asking, is there a change in the symbiont density or vitality leading to them being expelled from the coral? Um, so the... Yeah, um, so, so the... the I guess the best way I can explain it is that there's there's a combination of factors that is affecting cell density in the measurements that I showed for those for those um, holobionts which were not performing uh, well. You do s tend to see a, uh, a a an effect initially on the growth of the or the reproduction of the uh, of the algal um, cells within the host. But then as that progresses, you also start to see algae being expelled, which then further increases the rate of decline of the algae within the host. And so we, we actually, it's really hard for us to monitor uh, those two, uh, I mean, which of those is occurring at any particular time. And so we're just measuring the density overall. Um, so, so both of those factors are influencing in terms of the reduction or the, the reduction in the coral density within the host. Um, they don't. We know what the maximum density is for for, for algae within the coral larvae, and uh, they never come close to approaching that. Okay, and then one final question from uh, Dr. Kuzma. She's um, you might see it in the chat there. She's asking about the. The introduction of the up-down regulation of certain heat shock proteins as a strategy, and whether CRISPR can be a delivery system to the existing coral or other ways to up and down regulate that that heat tolerance. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting that the way the way in which um, they're managing to eliminate the bleaching response is actually to uh, knock out the the heat shock. Um, HSF1 uh, heat shock factor. And so uh, it does appear that the way that the, to eliminate the bleaching response in the host is to make it incapable of responding to stress, as opposed to making it more capable of responding to stress. Uh, and that's, uh, that I think is another, my personal opinion is that that's another indication that the, that the process is actually, um, is it's it's the it's initiated by the the symbiont and there's a detection process that occurs in in the host, um, but uh, yeah, I th there's still a lot more work to do to try and figure out. But the 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 um, but Phil Clevis is looking very specifically at heat shock uh, responses in the in the host and how those uh, the, the variety of the heat shock proteins uh, um, may contribute to to heat tolerance. In general, the data that I've seen is that the coral is actually 
um, more heat tolerant than the symbion. So the coral, uh, the threshold for, for corals is higher than it is for the symbiont. Um, and so the 31 degrees that we're looking at is probably still okay for, for, for a large number of corals, but is not okay for the symbiont. As the temperatures go higher, I think uh, the, the, the real crisis may occur when, when we get to temperatures where it's not only too hot for the symbiont, but it's also too hot uh, for the coral. Um, and so just improving the symbiont may, be, may at that point then not be enough as you start killing the, the host as well. I mean, directly from the heat as opposed to from starvation. All right, excellent. So I just wanna thank you again so much for staying up late for, with us. Um, so if everyone can give sort of a virtual round of applause and thank um, Dr. Edwards again from visiting with us all the way from Western Australia with some really fascinating work um, that shows, uh, you know, some glimpses of hope that we might be able to reverse some of the damage that we've already caused. So thank you again, Owen. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.